Another day, another flip for your Alabama Crimson Tide. This time it's an in-state kid from Florida State. You are Locked On Bama, your daily podcast on the Alabama Crimson Tide. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody, and welcome back into Locked On Bama. Luke Robinson as me, Jimmy Stein as him. Jimmy, Alabama gets another commitment today. By the way, this episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. I cannot wait to tell everybody about Bird Dogs when I read about it later on because they sent us some new merch, and I got to tell you about it. But anyway, Alabama got another commitment today, this time from Radarius Red Morgan from Central Phoenix City, 5'11", about 175, 180, a defensive back. That's probably going to wrap up Alabama's defensive back class you would think uh, after getting Peyton Woodyard the other day to flip from Georgia, and now they get uh, Red Morgan to flip from Florida State, uh, two big pickups. And my bet is for those who are stargazers, like moi, I love a, a stargazing as much as anybody else. My bet is Red Morgan gets the Bama bump and it's deserved. Well, in addition to, I mean, I mean, again, it's it's part of how the recruiting process or how the the ranking process works. It's it, it, in this case, if Red Morgan is bumped from a three star to a four star, uh, which wouldn't be surprising at all if anyone read Charles Power, who's, who's the head of the rankings uh, uh, department at On Three, uh, his review of Red Morgan sounds like he was talking about a four star. Uh, he even compared Red Morgan to Jordan Battle. Was, was his comp, and he did a good job explaining why. Um, it, it wouldn't just be the Bama bump, in my opinion. I think back when Red got his initial ranking, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, I would say, heavily recruited. And then since that time, he committed to Florida State, who's recruiting extremely well. He chose Florida State over Miami. Another team is recruiting really well. Those two really battled it out for him. Um, and, and Alabama wanted a closer look. See, Alabama didn't get a good look at Red. Morgan, what do we say all the time about they need to see you in camp? Well, Red came to Tuscaloosa on the Alabama practice fields to compete in a seven-on-seven event for his high school team, and it was there that Alabama got to see him in person. They're like, you know what? We, we, we love this guy, and they've been pushing hard for him ever since. So I don't know that a kid who chose Florida State over Miami, who then became a high priority for Alabama, who also at any time probably could have committed to Auburn, uh, who's also got a top 15 class that, that they've put together, that just sounds like a four-star to me. Uh, and then you watch the tape, w- w- which makes him look better than any of it, frankly. And we'll talk about that uh, sh- uh, just shortly. But uh, I do think there's a good chance he will end up a four-star. But what I would want the stargazers to uh, to contemplate here, and I get it, I want to finish as high as possible in the recruiting rankings. I do too. But if Red gets a, a fourth star or not, he's the same kid. If we're getting the same kid, it's not like if you get a fourth star, all of a sudden he becomes an even better prospect. We're getting the kid for what he is, whether he's a two, a three, a four, or a five. Uh, that's what we're getting. We're getting Red Morgan, uh, and, and he is what he is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited because I think he's a good fit in what we do. And, and again, the tape is the tape's really interesting. I have an out there cop while agreeing with Charles Power that Jordan Battle is an excellent comp for him. Uh, well, no, I mean, I'm sorry. Charles was comparing Peyton Woodyard to Jordan Battle. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but he did rave about Red Morgan. Red, to me, uh, is very difficult to comp, and I haven't settled on one yet. Peyton Woodyard, I settled on uh, Vinny Sincerity, uh, which is which is like, wow, where did he come up with that? But uh, I, I like the Vinny Sincerity comp for Peyton Woodyard a lot. Uh, As far as Red, I haven't settled on one yet, partly because he's a little unique. I see him as maybe a star, and I want to say Javi Arenas. I mean, when I watch his tape, that's who I want to compare him to, but I'm hesitant to compare him to Javi because I think if he doesn't play star, he's going to play safety, and that's not really a Javi thing. Another comp I wanted to compare, a lot of people get upset about this, but he reminds me a lot of a a fairly highly recruited player back from from over a decade ago or more, Charles Jones from Georgia. Uh, he reminds me a little bit of that. Uh, I see some Xavier McKinney in him. So I, I'm going to continue to watch the the Red Morgan tape before I settle on a copy. He, 
he's a little bit of everything because, and, and this is really super interesting about Red Morgan. He's a safety, or at least that's the industry position, okay? And Alabama, I think, is recruiting Red Morgan as a safety who might play star. But when Alabama fell for him, like when Alabama was watching him and went, we want this guy, he was playing cornerback. And that's what Alabama was like, this guy's better than we thought. We, we, we like this guy a ton because they're watching him play corner. Again, that doesn't mean Alabama likes him as a corner. I just think it's real interesting when you're throwing it into the mix of who Red Morgan is. In so many ways, even though he's an in-state player, Luke, he's a new name to us because Alabama's really only been recruiting him hard for about a month. Prior to that, they just had a relationship with him. They're aware of him. They liked him. It was just, hey, we like you. Here's an offer, but we need to see you in camp. Okay, and that, that had been the relationship. It's only been in the past month that uh, Alabama's been pretty hardcore, like uh, we, we need to flip this kid. We want him in the class, but he is a high priority to Alabama. This is not a, hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, the, the kid that went to Florida State the other day, uh, Bol- you know, Bolton. Uh, it, it's not like we lost him so we're taking red morgan i i think uh, we'd have taken red morgan regardless uh they they like him a lot and uh again there's some corner skills he looks like a star to me most people think he's a safety uh i'm gonna watch the tape a few more times before i settle on the comp but uh gosh uh i'd, I'd work uh, i got that mixed up with peyton woodyard we just flipped him and i've been work. i worked on that comp for a long time drove me nuts i went through a whole list and uh man i really worked that comp up before i came up with Vinny sinceri I guess I was just anxious to share that. Uh, well, you know, Vinny appreciates it. How about that? I'm sure uh, he's good. He's good. Peyton Woodyard's a heck of a, a heck of a prospect. But you know, Vinny wasn't super highly recruited. But when you look back at Vinny's career at Alabama, he should have been. I mean, yeah. freshman starter, early entry, uh, pro, uh, started every year. He was on campus, coach on the field, great special teams player, and uh, in the end. Uh, Vinny was what six foot two hundred four five eight. Peyton Woodyard six foot two hundred four five eight. Coach on the field, great special teams player, excellent tackler. Probably not a first round pick based on measurables, but third, fourth, fifth round pick. I mean, I'm describing Vinny when I describe Peyton Woodyard. So that's where that comes from. Jimmy, I need to tell everybody about bird dogs now. And really, I'm supposed to read them in the second segment. I just read uh, between the second and third, but I'm going to stop right now. Bird dogs make you look and feel awesome. I mean, dare I say delicious. And let me say this. This is how much I love bird dogs. I got a box. We got some merch. I don't know if you've gotten your merch yet, but I got a box. I have, I have not. Okay. I got a box. Um, they sent me some joggers, like that's the new kind of pants that everybody's wearing, and some more shorts and a bird dog's hat that you will get free if uh, you go to bird dogs and use promo code locked on college. Um, I love this stuff, man. I'm so excited. Like, this is so cool to me. Uh, w- what a great sponsor they are. Um, I'm, I am going to look, look, I'm going to stand up. I got to make sure that I stand up correctly. I'm going to stand up right now, make sure I don't hit my head. Look, can you see these shorts that they got? Look at this. Look at that. We're making me look all slim and trim and fantastic. That's awesome. That that That's bird cool. dogs, man. That's what they do is they make you look awesome. I mean, they just really do. I, I appreciate them so much sending this stuff. Um, we got a free hat uh, that I, I'm going to let my son have it. That's how, that's. How, I think he looks better in hats than I do. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on college or enter the promo code locked on college. Get that free white hat. I'll bring it out next time. Actually, you know what I did? Jimmy, I totally forgot this. I'm going to put the picture up in a minute, but I forgot. I took a picture of my stuff. I was so excited about it and I because I wanted to put it up there, but I'm going to put it up in a minute. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college telling you you're going to love these things. There's some people in the comments that have already been. They say, hey, you're right. This stuff's awesome. We're not messing around. We got great sponsors. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. All right, Jimmy, on the next podcast, hopefully we'll talk a little more practice. Um, seems like practice reports are a little few and far between right at the moment. Uh, I have heard some good news about uh, Deontay Lawson being uh, more of a vocal leader. But, you know, and I'm going uh, just because uh, it really liked the picture, I'm going to put that picture up. I, I took it from uh, 
the Alabama football Twitter page. I hope that that's okay. Like there's a picture of Deontay Lawson looking like a leader. Um, but we'll talk about him a little more as the week goes on. Instead, I wanted to talk a little bit more recruiting for a second because there is talk, and this came a lot came from Bama Online, the site you work for, from Tim Watts talking about how uh, another flip could be coming for Alabama, this time from Jay Lindsey, a tight end from here in the state of Alabama, a big guy. He reminds me of, I believe his name was Michael Parker that was committed to Alabama a few years ago. It, now, he ended up signing and he ended up transferring, if, if memory serves. But um, he was a, a really good, solid guy. It just didn't pan out. Sometimes it won't pan out. But uh, Jay Lindsey feels like a, a sort of a tough – uh, lunch pail kid um, when it comes to tight ends. And, and you know, Tommy Reese has an affinity for tight ends, so this could be a very positive thing. Uh, do you? He's committed to Mississippi State right now. Do you think a commitment, a commitment, a commitment is imminent? That is hard to say uh, right. right in a row. Uh, I hate to use the word imminent. Imminent sounds like, hey, by the time y'all have heard this, he's committed or that guy. We don't know. Uh, we don't know. We just feel like the, the prediction at BOL is that he is going to flip from Mississippi State to Alabama. That's a prediction. And when we say prediction, we mean exactly that. It's a prediction. Uh, now, our batting average is pretty good on these things. We, we, we can brag about that a little bit because the batting average is good enough to brag about. Uh, so that, that that is the prediction. Now, in, in terms of win, not sure. But in terms of what kind of player he is, uh, another camp offer. So keep in mind, this is someone that's worked out in front of the staff, in front of Nick Saban, uh, in, in front of the tight end coach, in front of Tommy Reese. And, and then they all get on board and they're like, this is a guy we want. This is not uh, a backup plan. This is not option C. This is someone they want. Uh, in my opinion, he, he is a fills a specific need. As you know, under Tommy Reese, I, I think it's pretty clear we're going to be a very tight end friendly offense. That means having more tight ends and having more options, also having multiple types of tight ends. And here's the thing about Jay Lindsay is he's an inline tight end prospect. He's not a guy you flex normally. He's not a guy that lines up all over the place. He's not a guy where you're looking for a mismatch. He's a guy that's going to line up next to the offensive tackle and he's going to punish outside linebackers. This is what he does. This is what they evaluated. This is their projection in terms of, hey, we're looking for a guy who can do these things because we don't feel like in the future we have enough guys that do these things. The other tight end, for instance, that's going to be in this class, Caleb Odom, who's already committed to Alabama and is the number two, three, or four tight end in the whole country, he's a pass catcher. He's a Maury Knobloch. He's O.J. Howard. He's a guy you split out, move around, get the mass mismatches. But then you're like, ah, is he ever going to turn to the blocker we need? Here's the other half of Caleb Odom, right? here. Here's the guy you pair with Caleb Odom in a two tight end offense. Because if you just go Caleb Odom, and that's the only tight end type you sign, maybe maybe running the ball may not be your thing. You need to be extremely versatile. Like, for instance, watch how Alabama uses their tight ends this fall. I, I think you're going to see this. I think you're going to see Amari Nablack out there a lot. And usually when he's out there, not all the time, usually he's going to be paired with either C.J. Dupree or Danny Lewis, who's going to line up at the wide spot inside. So what we're trying to do here is come up with tight end pairs, one big physical seal the edge guy, one guy that creates mismatches and it's, he's very difficult to defend in the pass game. And, and that's what I like about Jay Lindsay. Those, guys, those tight ends are harder to find than you think. Do you remember about two cycles ago when Alabama just scoured the portal for a tight end that could block, but they, a tight end that they're like, we need a blocker. They ended up finding one that they liked as a blocker in Miles Kitzelman. And all Miles did, partly thanks to injury, but all Miles did was start in his first SEC football game. He started the Utah State game last year uh, because Latu was hurt. But the point being, Kitzelman played and he, he contributed. And I think he's going to be a contributor this fall, too, in some packages as a blocker. You need those guys. And they're hard to find. How many times have we found, Luke, throughout the Saban era where we've moved a defensive lineman to fullback or tight end? Uh, gosh, we did it with, with uh, you know, with Sean Draper under Mike Dubos, but, but really Michael Williams, you know, was a high school defensive line prospect that we turned into a tight end. He's probably been the best blocker of the Saban era tight end. I, I think Jay Lindsay is, uh, 
I, I think he's real impressive in terms of what we're asking him to do. I mean, I know it's a, it's a third offensive tackle, to be honest, but those guys are really hard to find because if you literally just want him as a tackle, you just play a tackle out there. But you don't want that if you're Tommy Reese. You never want the tight ends to be a tell. So sometimes what's going to happen, by the way, what makes the offense so fun is when you put Caleb Odom split out and Jay Lindsay at the, at the, at the Y spot, sometimes what's going to happen is Caleb Odom's going to go in motion and block down on the defensive end that you thought Jay Lindsay was going to block. And then Lindsay goes about six or eight yards with his hands up in the air and he's wide open. He's wide open. So you need a guy that's a little versatile. That's not literally a third tackle you can never throw the ball to. Lindsay is pretty ideal, I think, for what it is that they're looking for. And that's why he's been a priority for Alabama since he camped there. And they're like, aha, this is the kid we're looking for. Oh, he's so excited about his bird dogs that he uh, uh, has muted. It's a bird. I'm blaming this on bird dog. Let's call, it, let's call this bird dog Christmas. Why it's bird, do I? It's bird dog I, Christmas. I, I, yeah, that's totally understandable. I really do feel like um, Forrest Whitaker uh, in Good Morning Vietnam when every time Robin Williams got in the Jeep with him, the Jeep was already cranked, and yet he still he cranked, cranked it. it. And Robin Williams said, it's really simple. If the engine's making noise, don't crank it. And <laughs> that's how I feel. I mean, I'm so crazy about this. Anyway, good Lord. Um, I need to tell everybody about FanDuel now. Look, if I, I know I can bring you down with my muting, but FanDuel can bring you up with some winning football season is about to kick off and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can, when you bet on any Super Bowl winner that you, you know, any team you think will win the Super Bowl, you get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season, just pick any team to win the Super Bowl and you'll get bonus bets for every single victory they have throughout the season. You can use your bonus bets on spreads or player props, over-unders and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on, all one word. FanDuel.com slash locked on. I'm telling you, you'll love this website. All right, Jimmy, um, we've got to talk about a rather difficult subject here. I mean, we don't necessarily have to, but I feel like it's 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 worthy of, of some discussion. Henry Ruggs uh, was sentenced today three to 10 years in your former life, you were a lawyer. Um, so you'll probably be able to more add, add more to this than I, but um, I was on radio in, in Montgomery today and uh, this was brought up. And, and one of the things that was said was uh, the family was agreeable to this sentence. A lot of people uh, I've seen think this sentence is very light considering rugs was going <laughs> as fast as I've ever heard somebody go uh, on, on just a regular street and the, the victim in this case, who just so horrible uh, in the crash, she actually burned to death. She didn't die in the crash and her, her dog perished with her. It's just, it's just an, an awful, awful thing. Uh, also there was all this evidence brought forth about how uh, rugs had been at a friend's house drinking. And then he goes to top golf and he drinks with a lot of friends and, um, and he, his blood alcohol level was, uh, way above legal limit, but apparently there was some kind of um, uh, error, police error, I guess, with the, uh, the the taking of the blood alcohol level, something like that. It was, it was more like a a clerical thing in, in a way, but, um, and so that was one of the reasons that I think this sentence was agreed upon, because had it gone to trial, maybe that could have even led to a lesser sentence. Um I, I want to say this. I hope people out there, uh, and as horrible as this is, I hope people out there can can forgive Henry Ruggs, no matter if he ever plays it down to football again. I'm telling you, uh, I have had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times. Not saying that you can tell exactly what a person is when you meet him once or twice, but um, I feel like Henry Ruggs is, is, is a pretty good person who made a horrible, terrible, life-altering mistake um, that is, was very preventable, there's no doubt. And he will pay a price for this uh three to ten years and and my guess is he probably only do about three of them that's my guess that's the way things are seem to be leaning um and maybe 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 
he will have an opportunity to play pro football again. That was something that the host on the Montgomery radio station was talking about, how maybe that's a positive for him to be able to play football again. He'll only be 27, I think, when he gets out. And maybe the family was looking at it like, hey, you know, we would like to have some sort of compensation for this. Maybe there's – I, I don't know. Uh, but my thought was, boy, it's going to be tough. I mean, just the exp- the inexperience he will have for three years of missing football. Um and let's not even say what his mental state would be. Uh, but I think football is the furthest thing or should be the furthest thing from his mind right now. Uh, it's just an awful, horrible, terrible situation. I know that he also lost his best friend in a car crash way back when, when he was on his way to a, an AHSA basketball game, if I remember right. But, um, Jimmy, I, I don't know what to say. I just hope there that people out there can find some forgiveness in their hearts, uh, even though – and and still acknowledge Henry Ruggs deserved a punishment here, uh, and I think that it's it's quite fitting. I don't yet. If some people want to say it's a little light, okay, I can buy that uh, because it was so terrible. But um, I just uh, I I feel like eventually I hope everybody can forgive Henry Ruggs and he can move on because he didn't just affect the life of this victim. He, he cost himself and his family and his generations to come uh, millions of dollars. Yeah, there's absolutely no good comes out of this story whatsoever. It's just a complete tragedy uh, all the way around. Obviously, the real victim is, is uh, uh, the woman that died and, and and her family. You know, that's the real victim here. Uh, you know, but it's also okay to feel badly for uh, for Henry. In terms of light sentences, you know, my, my thoughts as someone who was practiced law for a long time, of course, criminal law wasn't my specialty. I mean, I know quite a bit about it, but it, it wasn't my thing. But, you know, a couple things here, three to 10. Uh, first of all, the sentence of, of if it's a 10 year sentence, but but he can seek parole after three. That's pretty standard. OK, I mean, generally, generally in state prosecutions, and this is a state prosecution, not federal, this is state in state prosecutions, it's kind of standard to serve one third of your sentence. And at that point, you can start of applying for parole doesn't mean it's going to be granted or accepted. There's a lot of factors that go into it, in, including proving your rehabilitation. Uh, but yeah, after a third of your sentence, you can start applying to uh, to the parole board for early release. He would remain a- almost certainly on very strict supervised probation for the period of his sentence, would be, which would be another seven years. One other factor to take into account is Henry has been under house arrest since his uh, initial charges. He Sure, he's been to house. That's not like being in prison. But his movements have been monitored, and he can only go to certain places uh, while he's got the ankle bracelet, bracelet on it. It, it operates as, as like a house arrest. So in many ways, he's already served over two years of house arrest. So I wouldn't say that his sentence is only three years. That's not true. Really, his sentence is 10 years, though he can get out of prison after three years, potentially, again, though he served o- over two. That's one thing. But the real point I would like to make is, you know, I think people that are convinced this is a light sentence uh, don't work a lot around criminal law. And I, I was, as a practicing lawyer, often shocked at how light sentences were for even some people who acted purposefully and violent and injured people. Uh, People who purposefully, hey, I want to kill or maim or injure purposefully, they did. And then the sentence would be much lighter than I I think most of us would suspect or know, particularly when you factor in that they can apply for parole after a third of said sentence. Uh, I've always said this as a lawyer, I think we should take a new look at the way w- that we handle sentencing in this country for violent offenses and for offenses that end in death or maimings that we need to, to, to do that differently. Because the thing about Henry is what frustrated me, Luke, was seeing a couple of references to, oh, the only reason he got this light sentence is because he's a famous football celebrity. That's not true at all. I, 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 it, it, based on my limited knowledge, this was pretty standard for uh, what would be called involuntary manslaughter, which means someone's dead, but Henry didn't target a person, a specific person, and intentionally 
you know, hey, this person over here that I want dead or maimed, I'm going to go do that. That's that's intentional. This was acting with reckless indifference to human life, manslaughter. And I think this that sentence is probably fairly standard. Now, I don't know about Nevada versus Alabama. I would just say in terms of general terms, Luke, that people would be surprised at uh, at what sentencing's like uh, across the country for a lot of violent crime. I'm not saying across the board. I'm just saying in some instances that I have personal knowledge, I was like, that's all they're getting for that? Uh, happens all the time. Oh, man, Luke's excited about those bird dogs. <laughs> How can I do I think <sighs> I think you believe I'm muted. It's totally understanding. I'm excited. I don't even have them yet. I'm fired up. I'm checking the, I'm, I'm going to go check the mailbox again and it's night talk. But I think when you're talking about something like this, it's so important to recognize context. And I, I think that's, you know, where for me, three to 10 years, I, what, what people say immediately is, well, somebody died, somebody died horrifically. And not instantaneously. It wasn't a good death at all. Um, and there are people like, he deserved more. But I, the context is important because I, I, there's no intent there. I, he certainly didn't didn't mean for this to happen. He didn't target her. You know? He couldn't serve any. I mean, I want to hear the like cases. Someone go find me that exact case in Nevada with these exact facts where someone was sentenced to a longer. I want to see that. If that's the case. I think we should re-examine this. But until somebody shows me that, I mean, I, show me the case where first-time offender, involuntary manslaughter, no prior record, and show me the, the, the law. And again, the sentence is 10 years. He's not guaranteed parole. And should he be paroled, the rest of the sentence, the seven years, that could be house arrest. That could be work release. It's certainly supervised probation, which means weekly or monthly drug and alcohol tests and meeting with your probation officer for years. Uh, it's not just, oh, the three years, it's all over. It's not that. It is a 10-year sentence. Yeah. I, I just It's just a, such a sad situation all the way around. I hate it for the uh, the victims and the victim's oh. family. No. And one, one more point, and you brought it up. It's very astute and it's true you know a lot of times in these cases these pleas these pleas, and this was a plea deal henry didn't henry agreed to, to uh, for a blind plea that means hey i'll say i'm guilty and let's go to the judge and we're going to tell the judge that i'm pleading guilty and the da is going to say hey, judge he agreed to plead guilty and and this sentence will satisfy us that sort of deal is usually and don't somebody write us and say oh that's not what happened in my case oftentimes those deals, the victim's family is a part of it. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, we're thinking about doing this. You guys okay? And Luke already said in this particular case, the victim's family, I'm sure begrudgingly was like, okay. That's a big part of criminal cases a lot. Sometimes, sometimes or oftentimes, the victim plays at least some level of role in whether the sentence is acceptable to them or not. And that's very important, I think, when it comes to these type cases. Uh, okay, what is the victim's family okay with it. yeah yeah 100 um okay that's going to do it for today's podcast thank you guys so much for joining us we promise to be a little bit more upbeat next time uh but this was a pretty uh alabama centric situation i mean henry ruggs is a pretty beloved player and um so i know our our hearts go out to uh both the victim's family and and the rugs family it's just awful all the way around so until next time everybody roll tide roll tide